Okay, we now uh, enter into the action phase, which is the main part of each turn, uh, and the Ottomans go first. Now, in the action phase, there are a number of different actions that each power can take, and, uh, and different powers uh, do get to take different actions. Uh, you'll notice next to the actions that it talks about the cost. Uh, so you can move guys, and that costs one or two uh, command points. Um, you can control an unfortified space. The Ottomans can initiate piracy. Only the Ottomans can do that. Um, you can assault a key or fight a foreign war. Um, or you can raise troops or naval squadrons. And all of these cost um, different things to do. Uh, and so remember, this game is a card drawing game. And um, uh, what happens is each power goes through an impulse, which is like a mini turn. Um, where they get to play one card, either for the command points, and then they take one of these, or more of these, more than one of these actions, or they play the card for the event. Okay. Okay, so it's the Ottomans' first impulse, and they are going to use this card for five command points. And for their first command point, they are going to move uh, these forces up to Belgrade. Now, when you move into a, as you can see, this is a key, it's controlled by Hungary, Bohemia, the Kingdom of Hungary, Bohemia at the moment. When you move into a key, a key is a fortified space. Um, if you look at the board, there are three different uh, shaped spaces. There are circles here. These are unfortified spaces. There are keys. These are fortified spaces. And there are also fortresses. And these are fortified spaces as well, these star ones. Now, whenever you move into a fortified space, um, the defender has options. They can either choose to fight a field battle or um, they can uh, withdraw into their key, uh, back into their fortified space, if they have four or less men. Now, in this instance, when you're attacking a minor power, like Hungry Bohemia, uh, obviously they don't choose. Um, for Hungry Bohemia, if they have more than uh, four men, they will always fight a field battle. If they have less than four men, they will always withdraw into their um, key. So Hungary withdraws into their key, uh, Belgrade. They withdraw those one troops. And so the Ottomans now establish a siege. Now, in order to take Belgrade, they're going to need to spend another CP on assaulting uh, this fortified space. However, a power is not allowed to assault the fortified space on the same impulse that they sieged the fortified space, which means that the Ottomans are going to have to wait until their next impulse uh, before they actually take Belgrade or try to take it by rolling dice. So the Ottomans spent their first command point uh, moving to Belgrade and sieging. Now, just a reminder, we played this card, which was worth five command points. So we have four more command points that we can spend. And what we're going to do is we are going to raise um, two troops. Uh, each uh, troop costs two CP to raise. So we're going to spend our other four CP um, to raise two troops. And we're going to raise them here in Koron. Now, another rule is that when raising troops or naval squadrons, you can only raise them in your home spaces. Home spaces are identified by their colour. So any space that has a green colour here. Even if later on in the game you control other spaces, like Belgrade, you take over them, you can't raise forces 
in those spaces because they're not your home space. So you can only raise forces in your home space. So we used uh, this card for its five command points. We spent one command point moving our men up to Belgrade and sieging. And we spent four command points uh, raising two troops in Koron. And that is the end of the Ottoman Impulse. Okay, it's now the Habsburgs' first impulse. And they are going to use this card, uh, not for the event, but for the four command points that you get there. Uh, they, you get to spend command points uh, on a whole bunch of different things. And the first thing that they are going to do is they are going to move all of their forces from Besicon uh, into Metz, which is an independent key. Okay, so they've spent one CP moving their men into Metz and sieging uh, that place. They still have three CP left. Let's have a look at what the Habsburgs can do. Um, the Habsburgs, English and French all get to do uh, what's called New World Actions. Uh, they can explore the New World, they can try and colonise the New World, or they can try and conquer the New World, and each action costs different amounts of command points. Now the Habsburgs actually begin the game uh, having already got, sorry, having already got a conquest and an exploration underway. And you can only do one of those each per turn, uh, which means that they can't explore or conquer, but they can spend 2CP on colonising. Now the benefit of exploring and conquering is that you can get victory points. The benefit of colonising is that at the start of each turn you get to roll for cards for each colony that you control. So the Habsburgs are going to spend their next 2CP on establishing a colony in the New World. And so what you do is you put the colony marker in the crossing Atlantic box. That's put there to remind you that you can't establish another colony this turn. You can only do one. Okay, so the Habsburgs have spent one CP moving their forces into Metz and sieging it. They've spent two CP um, establishing a colony in the New World. And remember that card was worth four, so they still have one CP left. Now usually when you have one CP left, uh, the best thing to do is to just raise a troop. Now, troops can either be raised as regular forces, or if you flip them over to their black side, or their silhouette side, they are mercenaries. It costs two CP to raise a regular troop, it costs one CP to raise a mercenary. Now in battle, they have the same effect. Um, each, uh, each one troop is one dice that you get to roll in a battle. However, there are a bunch of cards in this game uh, that let you kind of get rid of people's mercenaries, usually because they've run away or something bad has happened. So mercenaries are cheaper, but it's a bit of a risk uh, to use them in case someone uses a card against you. But we've only got one command point left, so the Habsburgs are going to raise a mercenary, or rather buy a mercenary for Vienna. Okay, it's now the English Impulse. And the English are going to play their home card. Again, remember home cards uh, get to be kept by the power uh, once they're used, and they can be used again on the next uh, turn. Um, the English are going to use their home card, and the home card for the English can do one of two things. Um, the first thing it lets you do is declare war on France, Habsburgs, or Scotland during the action phase. Ordinarily in the game, uh, if you want to attack someone um, in the action phase, you have to have already declared war on them uh, during the diplomatic phase. And if you haven't, you can't actually attack them. Uh, you can't declare war on them in the action phase. However, uh, the English have a really good home card that allows them to declare war if they play it for the event. They can declare war on either France, Habsburgs or Scotland during the action phase. Um, and then they still get to conduct uh, their 5 CP after that. So that's really helpful. 
Um, we're also told, and this is important because this is what England are going to do, that if England declares war on Scotland, France can intervene without playing a card. Um, and that means that England and France are at war and Scotland becomes a French ally. So let's have a look at how this plays out. Let me just zoom out here. Okay, so the first thing the English are going to do is they are going to declare, they play their home card and they declare war on Scotland. Scotland is here and they are seen with the light blue forces. So because they've declared war, we take some at war counters and we move over to the diplomacy table. All right, so England are now, here's England, they are now at war with Scotland because they played their card. Now, the card also says that France has the opportunity to intervene on the Scottish side if they want. And that what that means is, is two things. First of all, it means France will be at war with England. And the second thing is it means it will be allied with Scotland. Um, now, there's pluses and minuses. France is already at war with uh, the Habsburgs and the Papacy. Uh, so, you know, do they really want to open up another front against England? Uh, so that's a downside. Uh, however, the upside is if France becomes allies with Scotland, which is a minor power, they get all of their stuff including uh, this Scottish key. So there is a little benefit for France to do it and they are going to because it's fun. So uh, France intervenes, which means France and England are now at war with each other. Uh, they don't need to spend any command points to do this because uh, this is all based on the English home card and France automatically becomes allied with Scotland. So because France is now allied with Scotland, they actually get another key. And this is an example of what happens when, uh, France, uh, when a power takes another key. They were on three cards and 12 victory points. Now they're on three cards and 14 victory points. So we come over to the victory track and we move them up to 14. All right, then we go over to Scotland. And Scotland, because they are now a French ally, we need to flag them as French because they are a minor power, so France now controls them. We put hex markers on the, un uh, the unfortified spaces. Now, also notice that these spaces were Catholic, they're full colored. And so when we put markers on, we need to make sure we put them on the Catholic side, not on the Protestant side. Okay, so England has declared war on uh, Scotland. France intervenes and is now at war with England as well. And they become allies with Scotland. Now, because all of that has happened, England now gets to still spend... 5 CP. If you remember from the card, after they declare war, they can still conduct 5 CP. So, what are they going to do? Well, England needs to raise a big force in order to actually take out Scotland. So, they are going to spend 4 CP on raising 4 mercenaries. And then they're going to spend... 1 CP on moving into Edinburgh and sieging them there. Remember, they can't assault that key yet. They have to wait till their next impulse in order to do that. So they spent 4 CP raising 4 mercenaries and 1 CP moving to Edinburgh to siege. And that's the end of the English first impulse. Okay, it is now the French uh, impulse, and they are going to play uh, their first card, uh, not for command points, but for the event. This is Revolt in Ireland, and uh, by playing this, the English player 
must remove four layer units from the map and place them, along with any leaders desired, on this foreign war card. Now the Irish start with two land units. If the English strength drops below four land units, all new English land units uh, unit builds must be placed on uh, this card until the total of four is restored. So they have to keep on filling up this card before they can build anywhere else. This is a really good way to hurt England uh, without having to commit yourself. We're also told that if it's played by France or the Habsburgs, they can remove one of their land units from the map to increase the strength of the Irish land, uh, the Irish to three land units. So we take this card, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll even why don't we place the card in Ireland, uh, and the English now have to take um, four land units from uh, where they are. Now that's really annoying. But hey, they've got to do it. Now, at the moment, um, they probably don't need this guy in York, so they'll chuck him on for one. Um, they've got two guys in Calais, and what they're going to do is they'll take one guy off and put one on, because they really want to take number if possible um, but that could be risky because the French might be able to take Calais um, and <coughs> well, this is very risky but they're going to take one man off Bristol so they're leaving all their keys undefended which means they'll really rely on uh, having naval superiority to stop a French invasion um, and then they're going to take one dude from mercenary from their siege. They just need to split split that up as well. And they here are the four men. Now England get these four men back after they've won the war, uh, but they need to um, spend one CP to fight, and then they actually need to destroy um, the Irish troops. Now we're told there are two Irish troops there, but France, because they played this card, they can add a troop on if they want. So they're going to take a guy from Lyon, place him on there, just to make it harder on England. And that is the end of the French turn. They play uh, Revolt in Ireland for the event. Okay, so it's now the Papacy Impulse. And the, papal, the papacy are going to play their home card for the event, Leipzig Debate. Call a theological debate. You can either specify your own debater or specify that one Protestant debater is not available during any one round of this debate. What does that mean? Well, we're going to find out. Um, the papacy are going to call a theological debate. Uh, let me just move out. Here we go. Uh, they're going to call a theological debate. Now, you can do this just with command points. It costs three command points. But the papacy are using their home card for the event, which allows them to do it as well. Uh, in a debate, you have um, a papal defender and a Protestant defender in the debate. And depending on how they go in dice rolls, uh, either, either spaces get flipped to Protestant or spaces get flipped to Catholic. If a debater does particularly badly, uh, they can even get, if they're Protestant, they can get burnt at the stake. If they're from the papacy, they can be disgraced. And that gives victory points to the other player. So, how do we choose defenders? Well, ordinarily, the person who calls the debate chooses um, a debater at random uh, from their uncommitted pool of debaters. What does that mean? Uh, if we zoom in a little bit at these, at the papal debaters, uh, you will notice that they all have different bonuses that you can use throughout your turn. So for example, Tetzel uh, in the middle here, uh, you can use him uh, to get one extra CP um, to building St. Peter's Basilica when you burn books. Don't worry too much about what that means yet. But basically all the debaters get 
different bonuses. Once they use their bonus, you flip them over to their committed side. Now we've actually already done this with the Protestants, if you remember, in the 95 Theses. Uh, we use Boos's bonus, uh, which was uh, plus one die for the Reformation within two spaces of Strasbourg. If you remember back then, we used it to try and flip Nuremberg to Protestant. So because we used his bonus, he actually gets flipped over now and he becomes committed already. Uh, that is, he's, he's been committed to the task of helping the Reformation in that area. And so he's going to be less useful in the debate. So going back to how we choose uh, defenders, the power that calls the debate, in this case the papacy, usually has to choose at random one of the uncommitted debaters. Now all of the papal debaters are uncommitted, so ordinarily what you do is you take all the debaters, you put them in a bowl, um, and then you draw one from random, and that's going to be your debater for this debate. However, we have played the home card Leipzig debate and in this uh, card, we are told that we can specify which debater we want, or we can specify a Protestant debater that we don't want. So what we're going to do is we are going to specify that we want Eck. Now the reason for that is that each debater also has a debate rating. That's the numbers that you see on them. And the higher the rating, the more dice they get to roll, and the better chance they have of going in the debate. So we always want to sub in Eck for a debate if possible, because he's really good for the papacy. So we take Eck and we put him in the current papal debater box. Okay, now the papacy called this debate, and so they also have to choose a Protestant debater to debate. Now, in choosing uh, a defender for the Protestants, they can do one of two things. They can either choose at random from the collection of uncommitted debaters, or they can choose at random from the collection of committed debaters. If they choose a committed debater, uh, they only get one dice plus their debate rating. Uh, if they choose an uncommitted debater, they get two dice plus their debate rating. So it's always better, if possible, to choose a committed debater because they get less dice. The other thing to notice, however, is that Busa is the only um, Protestant debater who is committed at the moment. And you need to be really careful when committing uh, debaters that uh, you don't leave just one hanging uh, who isn't very strong. Because what the papacy can do now is they can say, I'm going to draw from the committed pile of debaters. And even though they have to draw at random, since Busa is the only committed debater, he is going to be picked. So I hope that made sense. But um, Busa is now going to be uh, the one who goes against Eck. Now, how many dice do each debater roll? Well, um, because the papacy called the debate, they are the attacker. And um, they get to roll um, three dice as their base dice, plus their debate rating. And so for Eck, that's another three. Oh, sorry, dropped a dice. That's another three. And if you look at X, um, if you look at X bonus. X bonus is also that you get one die in debate attacks. So we commit Eck. Uh, debaters always get committed if they're in a debate anyway. And we get an extra die. So the papacy actually get to roll seven dice in this debate. Three base dice for being the attacker. Three dice because Eck uh, is debating and he has a debate rating of three. And one dice, because X bonus, is that he gets to roll an extra dice. So that's pretty good. Now, how much do the defenders, the Protestants, roll? The defenders get to roll two dice if they're using an uncommitted debater, but they're not. So they get one base dice, plus they get um, their debate rating. 
So they will get three dice. So it's seven dice versus three dice. Now, that is not very good for the Protestants. They could lose a lot of Protestant spaces in this debate. Uh, and even worse, Busa is in real threat of being burnt at the stake. However, thankfully, the Protestants also have a home card that can help. So, if we just zoom out for a second, the Protestant home card is Here I Stand. It is taking a bit long, but this will be helpful in understanding how the religious side of things work in this game. The Protestants have a home card. Now, one thing that they can use this card for is to draw any card from the discard pile. That's pretty good. Another thing that they can use this card for, however, we're told if Luther is alive, the Protestant may substitute Luther, even if he's already committed, for any debater during any round of a debate in the German language zone, and then get to draw a new card from the deck. Um, now the replaced debater is also going to be committed. Um, so that is really good. Basically it means you get to sub, if when you play this card, you get to sub Luther into a debate if you feel like uh, your debater isn't going to win. And this sort of reflects the history when uh, Eck was really slamming uh, Karlstadt and, um, and Luther would sort of sub in for him and help him out. So we're going to take Busa out, having played this card, and we're going to sub Luther in. Now, because he's in the debate, we commit him, which means sadly we don't get to use uh, his bonus. So that's a shame. But now the Protestants have a much better chance. Luther was uncommitted, so he gets two base dice, plus four, that's six. So now it's six versus seven. Uh, he's got a much better chance of, um, of doing well in this debate. Uh, because we played the home card, we're also told that you get to draw a new card after playing it. So we put his home card there. We draw a new card from the pile, and we put it there. All right, well, let's now do this debate. So the debaters roll their dice. We'll do the papacy first. So two, four, six, seven, and we roll. Okay, so they did very well. They got four hits. Remember, um, a roll of five or six is a hit. We got four hits, that's very good. And we'll put that up there to remember. Now, Luther. He rolls two, die, two base dice because he was uncommitted and four for his rating. So he rolls six. Okay, Luther did not do too bad either. He rolled three. The Protestants rolled three hits. So there you go. It is a four to three result in the debate. Now, what does that mean? The difference in hits... Uh, kind of like the Diet of Worlds, the difference in hits uh, is how many spaces the winner gets to flip. In this case, the papacy is the winner. So they now get to flip one space in the German language zone because they were versing a German. Uh, they get to flip one space back to Catholic. Just to let you know also, if the difference in hits is higher than the loser's battle rating, uh, that loser gets burnt at the stake if they're Protestant, or they get disgraced if they are um, from the papacy. So with Luther, it's pretty unlikely he'll get burnt because he's got such a high battle rating, uh, such a high debate rating. However, if it was Busa instead of Luther, uh, it could have happened. So the papacy get to now flip one space back to Catholic, and they are going to flip mains back to Catholic now. And that is the end of the papacy's first impulse. Okay, it's now the Protestants' impulse. Again, they can do a bunch of religious uh, stuff. They can translate scripture. 
um, that gives them victory points. And also once uh, the New Testament is translated or the Bible is translated in different languages, they get to take Reformation attempts. They can publish a treatise, which allows them to have Reformation attempts as well. Or they could call a theological debate like we just saw. The Protestants are going to spend 2 CP from this card um, on publishing a treatise. Now, when you publish a treatise, you get to make two Reformation attempts uh, or conversion attempts uh, in the language zone that you specify. However, I am also going to commit Karlstadt, uh, this debater, and if you have a look at what he lets you do, uh, when you commit him, you can target three German spaces with uh, publishing treaties. So instead of two, I get to target three. However, uh, unrest will happen in the town uh, if I fail to actually convert it. So we'll see what happens. So I will just go over now to Germany. Um, and Karlstadt is now committed. So I flip him over and put him back. And let's have a look at the three spaces that we're going to target. Now, I really want to take Mainz back, if possible, um, because that's a, a good spot. So let's just do the maths. I get one dice because I have a Protestant space adjacent to it. And I get, um, now, how many dice do I get if I have a man actually in there? That's a good question. I get two dice if I have a force in um, in the space that I'm trying to convert. So I actually get three dice all up for trying to convert mains. So we'll see what happens. Ah, wonderful. I have um, rolled a six. And remember, the Protestants win uh, in all of these. Um, conversion attempts, which means a six is an automatic conversion. So uh, that theological debate that happened, that the papers he called, all well, that was to convert mains back. Well, they failed because, well, they succeeded, but now I've converted it back. Okay, now the next one that I'm wanting to convert is Trier. Trier, if you look here, is another. Um, electric because it's star shaped so it would be nice if I could take that one as well now um, having a look the Protestants have one adjacent um, uh, Protestant space one force so they roll two um, I'll just move Ferdinand out of the way so we can see Trier has one Catholic space here, and one Catholic space here, and one Catholic force here. So the Catholics will roll three. But we first roll two dice to see how the Protestants go. Okay, they rolled best is a four. The Catholics now roll three dice. Oh dear, they rolled five. Now, if you remember, because we committed Karlstadt, um, we get one extra attempt, but we also were told that if it fails, an unrest marker has to be put in that spot. Now, what is the downside to that? Unrest markers don't count when trying to calculate uh, how many dice you roll in Reformation attempts. So in one sense, it's kind of good because the Catholic um, space doesn't count at all. However, if we do convert that later to Protestant, it won't count as a Protestant space either. And the Protestants need spaces to flip to Protestant to get victory points. So we want eventually for that unrest marker to go, but we'll have to wait. Now the Protestants still have one more turn. Uh, they can get three Reformation attempts. So they're going to go for Worms. Um, and they have one... Protestant space, two Protestant space, three with um, their dude. So we roll three dice for the Protestants. Bingo, we got a six. So worms flips. Now, 
I haven't been showing you this yet, but whenever uh, we flip spaces to Protestant or Catholic, we need to update how many the Protestant spaces track. So let's just count how many we have. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Protestant spaces. And so we go over to the Protestant spaces track and we move that up to seven. Now, why does that matter? Well, if you look at these numbers underneath, you see that it affects how many victory points the papacy get and how many victory points the Protestants get. At the start of the game, the papacy get 15 and the Protestants are on zero. Now, because the Protestants have gained a few spaces, the papacy have lost two victory points and the Protestants have gained it. So we should update the board to show that. So the Protestants have gained two victory points, the papacy have lost two. And that is the end of the Protestants' impulse.